Brian, are you a Yankees fan? Hey, Brian, are you a Yankees fan? Okay, yeah, let's go. <clears throat> okay, folks, it's time. So let's get the show on the road. We're going to start off. <clears throat> Today, we're going to continue talking pricing, pricing, more pricing. You're going to be sick of pricing and multiples by the end of today, right? And as with every other one of these classes, let's start with a very simple test of how pricing plays out. So here's the first one. Okay? And um, Joe, you can help me out here, Joe Betish. Um, you're looking at three companies. They're in the same business. They have the same cost of equity, 10%. Company A has a return on equity of 12%. Company B has a return equity of 10%. Company C has a return on equity of 8%. So the difference is they have different returns in equity. Which one of the three is most likely to be trading at below book value? Company C. And what is it about company C that makes it likely? So the return on equity is lower than, the, than their cost of equity. In fact, today we're gonna to draw out a very explicit relationship between price to book, return equity, and cost of equity. If you tell me the cost of equity and return equity of your company, we can draw a conclusion about what it's trading at. Now, normally when we look at return equity, we use it as a measure of successful management, right? High return equity companies are well, done, well managed, but low return equity companies are badly managed. I'm going to add a cautionary note to that conclusion. And, I'll, and to, to illustrate what I mean by the cautionary note, let's assume it to company C, which has this low return equity. It's taken bad investments in the past, right? The accountants decide to write off those investments. They're going to reduce your book value of equity by 50% overnight. Holding all its constant, what's going to happen to the return equity at C? It's going to go from 8% to 16%, right? It's going to look good on an ROE basis, but it's really not because it's taken great projects, but because it's written down its book equity. Anytime you use a book equity base number, remember that fact that comes into play. What accountants are doing is always in the background, and sometimes it can swamp out what you're trying to measure with that return equity. We're also going to talk about revenue multiples, right? What multiple of revenue should you trade at? Yesterday I was watching uh, Shark Tank on CNBC after six o'clock. It's Shark Tank episode after Shark Tank episode. Some are throwbacks in time. So like a 2013 Shark Tank. This lady comes on, she's selling something to do with weddings. You know, this etching. And she had 600,000 in revenues in the most recent year. She kept talking about how much that she'd made 600,000 dollars last year. It was the revenue. She hadn't made any profit. She wasn't paying us a salary. And she kept insisting that her business was worth $2 million. So some, you know, one of the shots says, why do you think it's worth three or $2 million? And she said, businesses typically trade at three to four. She was very assertive about this. She said, businesses usually trade at three to five times revenues. And as I was watching, I said, really? I didn't know this. Is this true? It's definitely not true. Three to five times revenue. Some businesses, do they trade at three to five revenues? Yeah. But let's see what kinds of businesses might trade at three to five times revenues. The typical multiple of revenues companies trade at is closer to one or one point five, not three times revenues. So let's say you're the retail analyst, use revenue multiple. And you pick companies based on low revenue multiple. The company trades at a low multiple of revenues, you view it as cheap. So my question is a generic one. If your sector includes department stores, luxury retailers, discount retailers, which of these groups of companies is most likely to look cheap to you? Keyword is look cheap to you. Hey, Professor, we can't see your screen um, and your voice is kind of chopping in and out as well. This is an internet problem again. Everything's black. We video. see your like desktop, but not your window. You know what? Let me turn on my video. Some, I had the same issue earlier today. We've had, I've had some issues with broadband today. So let me stop my video, see if that makes a difference. Can you see my screen now at least? Yes. Yeah, okay. Let me leave my video off because obviously my broadband can't carry both me and the, and the screen. The screen's more critical here. Which of the three groups do you think would trade at the lowest multiple of revenues? Shari, you want to try? Shari, what is the question again? <laughs> 
Well, let's say you're an analyst, you're looking at companies that created low multiples of revenues. That's what mm -hmm. you think of as cheap. And you're looking across the retail sector and you've got department stores, luxury retailers, discount retailers, all within your, your arena. Yeah. On a, as, a, as a multiple of revenues, which of these groups is most likely to look cheap to you, trade at low multiples of revenues? I guess discount retailers. Because and what is it about discount? You're absolutely right. What is it about discount retailers that will make them look cheap? They'll probably have the lowest revenues of the lot. They're, but it's a multiple of revenues, right? So basically, the lowest dollar revenues can actually help because you can trade at a much higher multiple. It can't be the revenues. What else do discount retailers have that sets them apart from luxury retailers? Even if they have the same revenue. Walmart is a discount retailer. Mm -hmm. It has hundreds of billions of dollars in revenues, right? Mm -hmm. Gucci is a luxury retailer. It's only 15 billion revenues. Gucci trades at a higher multiple of revenues than Walmart does. Yeah, I think someone wrote in the chat, but I guess that said like they don't have a lot of, they don't have very high margins on their sales. That's it, right? It's margins. Low margin businesses trade at low multiples of revenues. High margin businesses trade at high multiples of revenues. I'd like to show you how margins can be different across. This is from a few years ago. I saw a comparison of smartphone companies. It was like 2000, not even early in the game when smartphones were coming in. Just to show you the competitive advantage that Apple had. Take a look at the margins that Apple had on its business, around 35%, compared to the margins of almost every other competitor. I mean, based on that, I can safely predict that the multiple of revenues you're going to be willing to pay for Apple will be much higher than the multiple of revenues you pay for Nokia or Samsung or any other smartphone company. One of the things we're going to talk about today is what I call a companion variable. Sounds fancy, but the companion variable is the variable that best explains differences in a specific multiple. And with every multiple I'm going to talk about today, I'm going to identify what that companion variable is. Think of this as the one number you will ask for whenever somebody says a stock is cheap based on a multiple. So let me take you back to where we're in the notes. We were using PE ratios and I took you through that extended process of finding out what drove a PE ratio. And here's the bottom line. Low growth companies will tend to have low PE ratios. High growth companies will tend to have high PE ratios. You think so what? Now until the 1970s, if you look at every textbook on investing, the advice you were given was buy low PE stocks. There's a Ben Graham, a recommendation fed through. In the 1970s, a guy called Peter Lynch, you might have heard about him, was hired by Fidelity to be head of Fidelity Magellan, the very first growth mutual fund. Because until then, every mutual fund held everything. He was given a very specific mission. He said, go buy growth stocks. And he ran into a problem. Because every book he looked at said, buy low PE stocks. And when he looked at low PE stocks, none of them are growth companies. He said, this isn't fair. The system is weighted against growth companies. I have to bring growth into my decision variable. And he created a very simplistic version of the PE ratio that incorporated growth. Here's what he did. He took the PE ratio and divided by the growth rate. So I'll give you an example. Let's suppose you have two companies. One has a PE of 10, the other is a PE of 20. If I pick based on PE ratios, Clint I'd always Summer, pick the... I... I'm sorry, go ahead. Did somebody say something? Okay, if I pick based on the PE ratio, the PE of 10 will always look cheaper than the PE of 20, right? But what if I divided the PE ratio by the growth rate? So let's say the first company, the PE of 10 has a growth rate of 5%, and the second company, the PE of 20 has a growth rate of 25%. If I divide the PE of 10 by 5%, I get two. That's a peg ratio for company one. If I take the PE of the second company, 20, and divide it by the 25% growth rate, I get a peg ratio of 0.8. Peter Lynch's point is I'd rather have the low peg ratio over the high peg ratio. I'm going to buy the stock with a higher PE ratio because it gives me more bang for my growth fund. That's what a peg ratio is. I see analysts use it all the time. And I'll tell you up front, I think it's an extraordinarily dangerous ratio to play with. And you're going to see in a minute why. Remember how we looked at the variables that drove a PE ratio? I went to a two-stage dividend discount model. And I did a little algebra and I said, this is what the PE ratio for a high growth firm should be. I'm going to take that two-stage dividend discount model. That's what the, the equation is here. Divide both sides by the earnings and the growth rate. And what I will end up with is a peg ratio for a high growth firm. 
I know this one, that, that equation looks incredibly messy, but let's take a look at that equation because embedded there are some very useful lessons about peg ratios. Here's the first one. If I hold all else constant and I increase the risk, the peg ratio for a company should come down. In other words, for the same growth rate, with more risk, I will pay a lower peg ratio, which intuitively makes sense, right? You pay a lower P ratio because you have a higher risk. If I hold everything else constant and increase my payout ratio, my peg ratio will go up. Why? Because I'm getting more efficient growth. I'm paying out more and growth. But this notion that by dividing the price earnings ratio by the growth rate, I'm making growth go away. I've heard analysts tell me, look, I don't have to control for growth because I've already got the peg ratio. It's already growth control. That is not true because if you look at the equation, growth doesn't go away. In fact, it's everywhere. It's in the numerator, the denominator. It's become a really messy linkage between peg ratios and growth rate. I know these are all abstractions. So here's what I'm going to do to illustrate this. I'm going to go back to that very simple company I created last class. Remember the one I computed the PE ratio for? 25% growth for the next five years, 8% thereafter, 11.5% cost of equity. I plugged the numbers into that peg ratio equation you saw on the previous page. I came up with a predicted peg ratio for this company, an intrinsic peg ratio of 1.15. In other words, given the characteristics of this company, that's the peg ratio I should be willing to pay. Then I said, what if? What if I have a different beta? Guess what happens? As my beta goes up, my peg ratio goes down. Riskier companies will have lower peg ratios. We get a chance, we pick up the equity research report for a tech company. Many tech company analysts will use peg ratios. I think two years ago, I saw a, a, an equity research report on Cisco, where the equity research analyst computed the peg ratio for Cisco, but he compared it to the peg ratio for the S&P 500. The peg ratio for Cisco was 0.9. The peg ratio for the S&P 500 was 1.05. And he concluded that Cisco was cheap because it was trading at a lower peg ratio than the S&P 500. You see the flaw in that reasoning? Cisco is a much riskier stock than the S&P 500. It should have a lower peg ratio. Riskier companies should have lower peg ratios. If I hold everything else constant and I have to retain more of my earnings to deliver the same growth rate, Think of what, what I'm doing here. I'm retaining more of my earnings. I'm delivering the growth less efficiently. My peg ratio is going to get much lower. So at this point, I have a pretty consistent set of suggestions I can make. If you have a riskier company, you should have a lower peg ratio. If you have a company with a higher return equity, you should have a higher peg ratio. But here came the most troubling what if. I changed the growth rate in the next five years. And initially, here's what happened. As my growth declined, my peg ratio got lower. But there was a point at which as growth started to change, my peg ratio started to go up again. And this is troubling for a very simple reason. Remember I said, when you look at a company, you want to control for differences. When you're comparing peg ratios, you want to make sure your company is not riskier than the typical company, that it doesn't have a lower return in equity than the typical company. When it comes to growth, I don't even know what to tell you. Should it be lower or higher? Because a U-shaped relationship as you do here means growth and peg ratios can move in both directions. So I know analysts like to use peg ratios. Maybe you'll end up at a place where people use peg ratios, but have that note of caution in your mind. Peg ratios can very quickly start to come apart. So here's the bottom line in peg ratios. High risk companies will trade at lower peg ratios than low risk companies. That's pretty clear. Companies that earn return in equity, higher returns in equity, deliver growth more efficiently, will trade at higher peg ratios than companies that deliver growth less efficiently. But in terms of growth, initially as growth rises, peg ratios will come down, but there will be a point at which peg ratios will start to go up again. The companies with the lowest peg ratios in a sector will usually be in the middle in terms of growth. Companies at either extreme with really low growth rates and really high growth rates will end up with really high peg ratios. That makes it difficult to control for it, but it's, it's good to know that when you start to use peg ratios. Any questions on peg ratios? So to use peg ratios, you need a PE ratio and you need a growth rate, right? Without it, you can't do a peg ratio. Nick? Yeah, um, Professor, I, I don't fully get the mathematical intuition behind dividing by G 
Well, it's almost like you're asking for every 1% growth, how much am I paying as a PE? So think of it as a per, the, the payoff to growth, right? So the lower that number, the less you're paying for that 1% growth. So you're dividing the PE ratio by the growth rate. So when I divided the 10 PE by a 5% growth rate, it look, looks like mm -hmm. I'm paying a PE of two for every 1% growth. Whereas in the second yeah. example, or as I twenty, so if you're a growth investor, you want to get growth at a reasonable price, right? That's often the way yeah. they describe yeah. it. This becomes kind of a rough way of estimating what are you paying for the growth rate? And the lower the price, the better the bargain you get. I see. Thank you, Professor. That makes sense. Jakonge? Um, for the growth rate, do you use the terminal value growth rate or is it like the most? You're no longer in the DCF world, right? So remember when you're doing pricing, there is no terminal value. There's no 10 year. So basically it's PE ratio today and expected growth and earnings today. Okay. Right. You. If you use the terminal growth rate, you've lost, you said there's nothing to, to do because remember the terminal growth rate is constrained to be less than the growth rate of the economy. There'll be no difference across companies. The reason you have different PE ratios is because of the growth rate in the near term during the high growth period. Okay. Thank you, Tim. We have to use a conservative growth rate too uh, for this uh, PAG ratio. You just, or, you just or have like, to use a uniform growth rate, which is whatever growth rate you use for one company, you have to use for all. So I'll give you an example. You can grow, get growth rates by looking at what analysts are projecting as growth for a company. If you do that, do that for all of your companies. If you use historical growth rate, use historical growth rate for all of your companies. If you okay. use diluted, so whatever you do, it's got to be the same because you're making a comparative statement rather than an intrinsic statement. But then um, or, yeah. would it be risky? Cause like, uh, for example, a uh, Teladoc has 90% of growth rate this year, but then if I continue using that for the peg, like wouldn't that be? Well, you should be using an expected growth rate, right? In a mm -hmm. sense, that's what pricing is driven by. So if you okay. have an expected growth rate, you'd use it for every company. If you didn't have that, you'd be stuck with last year's growth rate, in which case you're yeah, absolutely yeah. right. Teladoc oh. is gonna look incredibly cheap for all the wrong reasons. Mm -hmm. Okay. Let's talk about price to book. And it's a value investors have always been very fond of price to book ratios. In fact, there's a very, there's a very commonly used conventional wisdom that a stock that trades at less than book value must be cheap. It's very widely held. You know what drives that? The belief that some are book value is what you will get if you liquidate a company, that you could actually buy the stock today, liquidate it and get the money, which is not true. So let's see what drives a price to book ratio. And I'm going to, you're going to start seeing what I'm doing kind of repeat itself. It's an equity multiple. So I'm going to go back to a dividend discount model. Simplest dividend discount model I can think of. Stable growth dividend discount model. Divide both sides by the book value of equity. I get an equation for the price to book ratio. The price to book ratio for a mature company is a function of four variables. Here are the first three, cost of equity, growth rate, payout ratio. If they sound familiar, they were the same three that showed up at PE ratio. But now see a fourth variable pop up, which is the return equity. The key variable drive price to book is return equity. In fact, if I took the growth out, you can see the four variables play out. The price to book ratio for a company is a function of return equity. The higher the return equity, the higher the price to book ratio. But here I can actually simplify this equation. If you remember when we did fundamental growth, I said the growth can be written as retention ratio times return equity way back in time. If I plug that back into the equation you saw on the previous page, I can actually write the price to book ratio for a company as a function of two spreads. In the numerator of the spread between return equity and growth, in the denominator of the spread between cost of equity and growth. Take a look at that equation. If that equation is true for a stable firm, you know what has to be true? If you roughly earn your cost of equity, your price to book ratio should be roughly one. Remember the starting example we did today, company B had a return equity roughly equal to cost of equity. That company should trade at roughly book value. A company that earns less than its cost of equity should trade at below book value. It doesn't make it cheap or a bargain. It just trades at below book value. A company that earns well above its cost of equity should trade at a premium on book value. The companion variable for price to book ratios is the return equity. And let me emphasize again what that means. If I'm a broker who calls you and says, this stock is cheap, it's trading at half of book value. The first question you should always ask me is what is its return equity? Most companies that trade at low price to book ratios 
have terrible returns in equity. So price to book is an equity measure, market value of equity divided by book value of equity. There's a variant on price to book that works for the entire company. And here's what, what the variant looks like. In the numerator sort of market cap, I use enterprise value, market value of the operating assets. And in the denominator, instead of looking at book value of equity, I look at book value of equity plus book value of debt minus cash invested capital. Using another ratio, let's make this very simple. You know what drove the price to book was return on equity and cost of equity, right? When you look at EV to invested capital, guess what drives it? It's return on capital and cost of capital. The equations look exactly identical. All I've done is replace price to book with EV to invested capital, return on equity with return on capital, and cost of equity with cost of capital. Companies that earn a return on capital that's roughly equal to the cost of capital should trade at roughly the value of their invested capital. Let's do the most widely used enterprise value multiple out there, EV debita. So by now you get the sense, it's an enterprise value multiple. I'm gonna go back to a discounted cash flow model, a simple one. In this case, that's this free cash for the firm next year divided by cost to capital minus the growth rate. That's just the terminal value equation. I'm using it because it's a mature company. If I break free cash flow of the firm down, I can actually write it out as EBITDA times one minus T. Trust me, I'm not changing the free cash flow firm calculation, I'm just writing it out broken down. Plus tax rate times depreciation, minus capex, minus change in working capital. That's the value of a firm in a DCF model. If I divide both sides of the equation by the EBITDA, I now have an equation for what should drive EV to EBITDA. And as I list the variables out, I want you to think about the intuition. The first variable that drives EV to EBITDA is the tax rate. The higher your tax rate, the lower the multiple of EBITDA you pay for a company. Park, when I did PE ratios, I never worried about tax rates, right? It didn't show up in my analysis. Why when I do EV to EBITDA is the tax rate entering the conversation? I'm not certain, but um, EV to EBITDA, I guess taxes are one of the last things you do when it comes to EV to EBITDA, so. Let's go back to PE. When I did PE ratio, what was in the denominator? Earnings. Earnings and it was net income, which was after taxes. So if you had a high tax rate, your net income already reflected that, right? So when I do PE ratios, I don't worry about the tax rate because it's already been incorporated into your net income. When I do EBITDA, it's before your tax rate. Think of an extreme scenario where your tax rate is 100%. I know it sounds absurd. How much did you pay for a company where the government takes away all your earnings? Nothing. The tax rate matters because EBITDA is a pre-tax number. So basically the first variable that drives EV to EBITDA is your tax rate. Higher tax rate companies have lower EV to EBITDA multiples. The second variable that drives it is your growth rate. Higher growth companies have higher EV to EBITDA and that's more intuitive. Growing faster, I pay a higher enterprise value. The third variable that matters is your cost of capital. If you're a risky company in a risky market, you have a higher cost of capital, you should trade at a lower multiple of EBITDA than if you're a safer company. And finally, how much you reinvest matters because I want you to grow efficiently. If you're reinvesting immense amounts back in the company to get this paltry growth rate, I'm gonna pay a much lower multiple of EBITDA for you. Now, one way to think about what we're doing in this section is I'm giving you the ammunition to ask me the right questions when I come to you with a company and say, this company is cheap, right? Because there are reasons why some companies trade at low EV debit down multiples. They have a high tax rate, they have terrible re returns on capital, they have low growth rates, a very high cost of capital. And those are all factors that you've got to control for. So let's try a simple example. Let's suppose you have a company with a 36% tax rate. CapEx of 30% of EBITDA, depreciation, which is 20% of EBITDA. Cost to capital of 10%, no working capital requirements. If I plug the numbers into the previous page, so think of this as the intrinsic EV to EBITDA, for this company with the parameters that I've just given you, the EV to EBITDA should be 8.24. I should expect this company to trade at 8.24 times EBITDA. That's my base case. Now, if I change the tax rate from zero to 50%, take a look at what happens to my EV debit. Everything else stays the same. But as my tax rate goes up, 
EV to EBITDA goes from 14 times EBITDA to about five times EBITDA. Why is it drop? Because the government keeps taking more and more of my earnings as taxes. I remember talking to a telecom analyst in Europe and his sector included every telecom company in Europe, which includes the Irish telecom company and Deutsche Telekom. And he used EV to EBITDA. And he kept noticing that Deutsche Telekom looked cheap relative to Irish Telecom, but traded at a lower multiple of EBITDA. But you know what the missing ingredient was, right? The tax rate in Germany is about 30%. The tax rate in Ireland was about 15%. Of course, Deutsche Telekom is going to trade at a lower multiple of EBITDA. The second thing I looked at was what happens EV to EBITDA is I have to reinvest more and more to get the same growth rate. And guess what? No surprise. The more I have to reinvest to get the same growth rate, the lower the multiple of EBITDA I'm willing to pay for the company. Which brings me to my third and final variable. If I hold all else constant and increase my return on capital for the company, the multiple of EBITDA I'm willing to pay is much higher. Remember I said last session to think about your perfect undervalued company. You want a company with low EV to EBITDA. You want the company to have low tax rates so you, because you don't want to explain away the low EV to EBITDA. You want a high growth rate and a low cost of capital. You're saying, what chance do I have looking? That's precisely why you do pricing is to find that mismatch. The price to book, peg ratios, EV to investor capital, EV to EBITDA. I'm gonna do one final multiple before I kind of abandon this because it's getting boring to keep going back to the same process, but let's do it one more time. If you ask me, what is it that drives EV to sales? I'm gonna go back to an enterprise value model, do the algebra and guess what? EV to sales ratio for a company is a function of the reinvestment rate, the cost of capital, and the growth rate. All variables that show up with every EV multiple. But there's your companion variable, after-tax operating margin. High-margin companies traded high multiples of revenues, and low-margin companies traded low multiples of revenues. So if I give you a multiple and ask you, what are the variables that drive the multiple? Don't reinvent the wheel. Go back to DCF model. You now work around with the variables and you should be able to tell me what the variables are that drive that multiple. I'm gonna use this to kind of address a question that I promised I would get to very early in this class. But remember at the start of this class, we talked about brand name. And I said, you know what? Brand name can be valued if you're willing to put the effect into cash flows, growth, and risk. I'm going to give you a very simple way of valuing brand name, but I'm also going to be open about the fact that it works better for some companies than others. And here's what I'm going to do. The power of a brand name comes from pricing, that you can price products at a high, that you can charge a higher price. You get higher margins. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take a brand name company. I'm going to get the multiple of revenues I would pay for that company given its margins. So its margins are 20%. Obviously, I'll pay a much higher multiple of revenue. That's going to give me my, so let's say I'm willing to pay four times revenues for this company given its margins. Then I'm going to revalue the same company assuming it loses its pricing power, loses its brand name. Much lower margins, much lower multiple. Let's say it's 1.5 times revenues. The difference in multiples captures the value of my brand name. I know it's uh, too abstract, so let me use an example. Now, this was about 20 years ago. I was called by somebody who, used to, who had been a student of mine who worked, who was pretty high up in the ranks of Coca-Cola. And he said, would you be willing to come to Atlanta and talk to our top management about the value of Coca-Cola's brand name? Now, why might a company be interested in the value of its brand name? Jacob, why might a company be interested in the value of its brand name? Um, probably because, you know, like you said, they can charge higher prices. So the low, if you value the brand name at a low price, then maybe that like like their pricing strategy. Well, the pricing is pricing, right? They already have the brand name. Why do they want to put a number on that brand name? So I, I agree. You know, so they already know their brand name. Why would they want to know how much that brand name is worth? Or maybe it also could be like they're selling the rights to that brand name. One is you sometimes might want to sell. So it might, Coca-Cola would never do this with Coca-Cola. But if you're a Quaker Oats and there's a single brand on the side that you have that you don't think much of, one is you might think about selling it. So one reason you want a value for a brand name is you might want to sell it. 
The second is bragging rights, right? I mean, there are services out there that rank companies based on brand name value. You want to be on those ranks because it makes you look good. The third is unfortunately accounting driven. Accountants increasingly seem to want to bring brand name to the balance sheet. So they're asking what number should I put on a brand name? So there are good reasons and bad reasons, but you can see them all play out. So this guy calls me and he says, you know what, I agree to. And clearly it wasn't to sell the brand name. Coca-Cola is, is built around the brand name. They were just more curious about how much the brand name is worth. And they'd been used to being ranked at the very top of the brand name value list. There's a service in the UK called Interbrand that actually ranks brand names every year from most valuable to least valuable. And Coca-Cola consistently would show up at the top, especially in the last century. So I show up in Atlanta, the top management team is in a room and I take them through a discounted cash flow valuation of Coca-Cola. So, I mean, you, you, you know, if you'd been in the room, you'd probably have seen the familiar levers, right? You've got margins, return on capital, cash flows, growth rate. And I finished my discounted cash flow valuation. And the value that I get for Coca-Cola as a company is about 80 billion. You know. So this is 20 years ago. So I finished the valuation and I get ready to do, deliver the climactic moment when you know, one of the people in the room, one of the top management team puts up his hand. It's a head marketing honcho. And he says, you forgot something very important. Now I'm wondering, what did I forget? Maybe I forgot an entire business or geography. I said, what did I forget? He said, you've forgotten the fact that Coca-Cola is the most valuable brand name in the world. I said, okay, so what exactly do you want me to do? He said, you should be adding at least a 20% premium to that 80 billion. He said, that's a dream. Why? He said, because that's what we do at Coca-Cola is when we buy brand name companies in other countries, we value them and then we add 20%. And I didn't feel the urge to be polite. I said, just because you do stupid things doesn't mean I have to do stupid things as well. He said, don't you think our brand name has value? I said, it's probably the only thing in this building that has value, it's a brand name. It's not your syrup, it's not your damn bottles, it's your brand name. He said, why aren't you adding a premium? I said, it's already in there. He said, where? I said, everywhere. Why do you think you earn 15.57% margins and a 20.84% return on capital? Every number in this valuation is brand name already embedded in it. This guy's a marketing guy. He said, I don't believe you. And I came prepared and I was lucky. I found a company called Cot, C-O-T-T. It's a Canadian company that makes generic sodas. The reason you've never seen their name is they actually sell their soda cans to grocery stores like Pathmark to put their own name. So when you see a generic soda, if you take a look at who made it, it's often made by Cot. So they sell a lot of cans of soda, but those cans are sold for 10, 12, 15 cents. And the margins are much lower than Coca-Cola's margins. So here's what I did. So let's assume that tomorrow we woke up collectively with amnesia. The only thing we don't remember is the word Coca-Cola and the red can that goes with it. I said, what would happen? You become a generic soda company. If you become a generic soda company, you're no longer going to earn 15.57% margins. You want to earn margins like a generic company. So here's what I, I took Coca-Cola and I revalued them with cot margins. So this isn't Coca-Cola versus cot, it's Coca-Cola valued as is and Coca-Cola valued with cot's margins. How big a difference can it make? Well, when my margins go from 15.6 to 5.3%, my returns on capital drop. My returns on capital drop, my growth rate drops. My growth rate drops, my value drops. In fact, the value that I get with cart margins at Coca-Cola are 15.4 billion. You want me to add a brand name premium? I just did. In fact, the difference between those two numbers, 64.2 billion, becomes the value of Coca-Cola's brand name. If you do a good valuation, there should be no premiuming left in the end. Because if you have a solid brand name, it should already be in the margin, should be reflecting your growth rates, your cash flows. There's no reason to add a premium. And I told you it's easier to do in some companies than others. It's easy to do in Coca-Cola. You know why? Their only competitive advantage is brand name. It's not taste, it's not syrup, it's just brand name. You know what the most valuable brand name in the world was last year? I told you Interbrand ranks companies in 2020. Guess which company was ranked as the number one company in the world in terms of brand name? Sriram, you want to try that or you want to have a question? Just a question. 
Uh, I have a question, but if I had to guess, I'd probably say Amazon. It was Apple. Amazon is not quite a brand name company, but you can see it. And if I tried this on Apple, what's the challenge I will face? So let's say I have to value the brand name at Apple. I have to fi first find a generic smartphone company, right? It's gonna be kind of difficult to do. But even after I did that, here's the second problem I'm gonna face. In the case of Coca-Cola, I'm assuming their entire competitive advantage is brand name. I'm capturing it in this number, right? But if you think about an Apple, in addition to brand name, what else is Apple bringing to the table as a competitive advantage? Hey, they have an operating system that's unique to Apple, right? They actually are one of the few companies where people who pay for styling. John Ive is a legend because of what he did with styling at Apple. This is a company that actually thinks seriously about styling. There could be probably four or five competitive advantages I could list for Apple. So when I capture what I call the value, what I'm capturing is the value of all of those competitive advantages, not just brand name. Does it bother me? Not in the least. And here's why. I buy Apple or I sell Apple. I don't buy Apple's brand name. I'm not buying Apple's styling. But here's why I'm concerned. Accountants are trying to slice and dice competitive advantages and put them on the balance sheet as assets. And it's not going to end well. Because they're going to stretch and they're going to do crazy things because they need to separate how much of Apple's value comes from styling and how much comes from brand name. And that's going to be almost impossible to do. But you had a question. Go ahead, Sriram. Um, I was wondering if you wanted to, like, I guess, do this process backwards, where, for example, you're doing like a back of the envelope calculation just for some brand. Um, is there, like, do you happen to have any data on potentially like the value of uh, good brand names, like how much of a premium that provides versus like? Do you want to do it? You want to do it quickly? Here's my suggestion. Look at the multiple of revenues your company trades at. Look at the industry average multiple of revenues. Take that difference. And if you have a brand name company, you should be trading at a premium. So let's say the typical company in the sector trades at one and a half times revenues, and you trade at two and a half times revenues. That extra one that people are paying is for brand name. It's a quick and dirty calculation. It's a lot of rough assumptions you're making, but that's probably the simplest way to do it. If you want something more direct, just compare margins, right? If you have a brand name company, the margin should be higher. Compare your margins to the industry average margins. And at least in a very rough sense, you capture the power of the brand name. And you know what you're going to find? 95 out of 100 companies that claim to have a brand name don't have one. Every company claims to have a brand name. But if you don't have a higher margin, why are we even talking about this, right? So that's a very quick and dirty test for brand name power. Look at the difference in margins and the multiple of revenues. Thank you. Okay. Nick, is your hand up from before? I think it is, right? Yes, I'm sorry, Professor. Yeah, that's okay. So let's wrap up where we are. So when we look at define, describe, analyze, at every multiple, we're using a discounted cash flow model to derive the variables that drive that multiple and then kind of running with it, right? PE, price to book. So save this page because I've summarized in this page, I think nine different multiples. And basically with each one, I've gone back to the root, which is what the what this kind of cash flow model allows you to do and derive the variables that drive each multiple. And I've tried to highlight with each one what the companion variable is. With price earnings, it's growth. Price to book, it's return equity. With EV to sales, it's margins. Focus on that companion variable to make sure you're not being taken to the cleaners. So we've defined, we've described, we've analyzed. Now we're ready to apply. And when you get to the application stage, there are two things you have to deal with. One is you're trying to value a company. What is it that we call comparable companies? And you're going to see that this is more subjective than it looks, what you call comparable. And second is, even after you bring in those comparable companies, how do you control for differences across companies? So let's start with the first one. When you sit down to do the pricing for your company, which is what the rest of your project is, and it's actually much less involved than your DCF. So when you sit down to price your company, one of the challenges you're gonna face is, what is that peer group that I wanna compare my company to? So who are you, who are you value in your project? Uh, I'm valuing AIG. AIG, so it's insurance company. So your first thing is I'm gonna go look for insurance companies. 
I and you can already see the choices you have to make. Am I going to compare to just US insurance companies or global insurance companies? Am I going to look at only large insurance companies or small insurance companies? If you define comparable very narrowly and say, I'm going to look at only large insurance companies, what, which, which branch of insurance today as you get most of its money from? Life, property, what's its biggest? So do you, know, do you happen to know whether? I let's think make it's, up. Yeah, go ahead. I think it's general insurance. General insurance. So let's say it gets 80%. So you might say, look, I want only large US companies that get most of their revenues from general insurance. You're going to end up with a really small sample because you've added so many criteria. If you say, look, and I'm just going to look for insurance companies, small, large, everywhere in the world, you could get up, end up with hundreds. You're saying, which one is better? There's no clean answer because with the companies that are very much like your company, there's less to control for. They're more similar to each other. That's good. But statistically, it's a much smaller sample. Statistics, it's better to have bigger samples. With the bigger sample, you're going to get more differences across companies. So here's the bottom line. Which you choose will depend on how you plan to control for differences. You say, what do you mean, how do you control for differences? You can control for differences by just comparing AIG to Allstate and saying, you know what, AIG trades at a lower multiple, but it's higher margin. So basically you can try to do a one-to-one -one comparison. For much of the 20th century in the US, if you were an auto analyst, you tracked only three companies for the entire century, GM, Ford, and Chrysler. Every statement you made about these companies was relative to one of those other two. That's a direct comparison. The second is you could tell me some kind of story about AIG rising from the ashes, putting 2008 behind it. Going, so you're telling me that's why it trades at a higher multiple. The third is you take whatever concerns you that's different about the companies and try to bring it into your multiple. That's what led Peter Lynch to bring growth into the PE ratio. Create a variant of the multiple I don't know how this will play out in insurance, but maybe you'll take market cap to insurance premiums collected or whatever you think is the driver. And the fourth, and this is what I'm going to try to push you towards, is use your statistics tools here to control for differences. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you through a series of seven examples. And with each one, I'm going to give you the data. I'm going to be a, the, take the role of a naive analyst and put out a buy recommendation. And I'd like you to tell me what I might be missing, right? So I'm the beverage analyst. This is way back in time. This is my sector. And I'm going to put a buy recommendation on three stocks in this sector. One is Andre's Wines, which produces champagne so cheap. You see the ads only around Christmas. It gives you a headache just looking at the ad. The second is Todd Hunter and the third is Hanson. You see why I picked those three? What do those three share in common? What makes them stand out? They trade at below 10 times earnings at the lowest PE ratios. So I'm being a naive analyst. I'm just picking the three because they're the lowest PE ratios. Here the action, the reason why they trade at low PEs is actually right in front of you because I've given you two other variables in the companies. Why do Andre Wine and Todd Hunter trade at low P ratios? What is it that they have? Sebastian? It's the low growth. It's low growth, right? Yeah. Hansen looks more interesting. It has high growth and low P, so you think this is good, but what does Hansen have that makes them potentially dangerous? It's the very high standard deviation. They're a risky company, right? And this is what I want you to start thinking about when you make comparisons. Initially, at least, when you look at something and it looks cheap, you're looking across, say, what is it about this company that might explain why? You're not trying to explain away the cheapness. You're just making sure you're not stepping into a minefield without thinking about the dangers. So it's true. If you look at Todd Hunter and Andre Wine, they look cheap, but they look cheap for a good reason. One has low growth. The other has high risk. Does this mean I'm not going to buy the stocks? Not necessarily, but it's going to be a note of caution I've got to bring in into the pricing process. I get fired as a beverage analyst after that recommendation. I land on my feet. I'm now the telecom analyst. The late 90s in the US, a lot of telecom companies around the world were being privatized and they were having their shares listed in the US in the form of ADRs. What's an ADR? It's a foreign stock listed and traded in the US in dollar terms. So these are the telecom ADRs that are in my portfolio. So take a look because I'm gonna put a buy recommendation on Telebrass. 
Telebras is the Brazilian telecom company, late 90s, emerging markets were really emerging markets, very risky and developed markets were much safer. So Telebras looks cheap, right? 8.9 times earnings. But here already is a note of caution. Its growth is much lower than the sector that worries you. But here's the other thing that should worry you. If you look across the sector, Indosat, which is the Indonesian telecom company, is an emerging market telecom. Telebras is an emerging market telecom. New Zealand telecom is a developed market telecom. You're saying, so what? Remember we talked about risk? You'd expect emerging market telecom companies to be riskier than developed market telecom companies. So your first pushback is, Hey, but it has lower growth. And second is, it's much riskier. It looks cheap, but it's lower growth and higher risk. Already you can see why if all you have are storytelling and subjective judgments, you're gonna get locked into a corner. So here's what I did. I started to open my statistics textbook to the chapter on multiple regressions. Remember those? You have a dependent variable and you have independent variables. The dependent variable that I'm trying to explain is the PE ratio across telecom companies. And the two independent variables I'm worried about is differences in growth and the fact that some of my companies are emerging market companies and others are developed market companies. Do you remember dummy variables from statistics? In your statistics class, did you ever talk about a dummy variable? Anybody know it? Jake, what's a dummy variable? What, what does it do? Well, it could either be one or zero and either it adds... one or zero, right? So here's what I did. I created an emerging market dummy variable. I put in one for all the emerging market telecom companies and zero for all the developed market telecom companies. It's kind of a rough proxy for, hey, maybe the market is treating emerging market telecom companies differently from developed market telecom companies. I ran the regression. What's the first thing you check? You check the R square, 66%. It's a, it, from, a, from a market regression perspective, that's pretty good. I'm not gonna look a gift horse in the mouth. But let's break the regression down in pieces. The constant, which is the intercept is 13.12. What is that? That's the base from which I'm gonna build the PE ratio for every telecom company. It tells me something about the level of PE ratios in the entire market. So that's not telling me much, but it's a starting point. The coefficient on growth is 121.22. You're saying, what the heck does that mean? Within this sector, every 1% increase in growth rates increases my PE ratio by 1.21. So think about it. If you're a telecom company with a growth rate 5% higher than mine, your PE ratio based on this regression is gonna be roughly six higher than mine. I've actually taken something that was subjective and made it much more specific. But to me, what jumped out from this regression was the coefficient on the emerging market dummy variable. Remember how Jake described it, right? Zero for developed market, one for emerging market. What does this minus 13.85 tell me? If you have two telecom companies, one developed market, one emerging market with the same growth rate, the emerging market telecom company is gonna have a PE P ratio roughly 13.85 lower than the developed market telecom company. It's how much the market is punishing emerging market companies. Remember the buy recommendation I sent you of Telebras? Let's see if it holds up. I took Telebras and I plugged in Telebras's growth rate and the fact that it's an emerging market company in the regression. So this regression is output from the regression packet, whether you use Excel or use Minitab or whatever statistics package, you get the regression output. I plugged in Telebras's growth rate and the fact that it's a emerging market company in the regression, I get a predicted PE ratio for Telebras of 8.35. Remember why Telebras looked cheap to me? It was trading at 8.9 times earnings, but after controlling for its low growth and the fact that it's an emerging market company, guess what I find? Even though the PE ratio looks low, it's actually overvalued given its growth and risk characteristics. The advantage of regressions is they cut past the storytelling and give you a way of bringing the data into play. Any questions on that telecom regression? So, I mean, of course, I'm keeping it simple. These are all, all you know, we'll call, they're called linear regressions. If you've taken a statistic class, you can make this much more sophisticated. You can have non-linear regressions. The reason I'm not gonna go there is this is not a statistics class. We're focused 
on pricing. I want to use the weapons I need to use, but nothing more. So I get fired. I'm sorry, Alex, go ahead. Yes, Professor. It's not maybe that much about this particular regression, but in general, when you pick comparables from several different countries, several mm. different economies, which have their revenues in different currencies, which mm. translate to different inflation um, rates. Wait, uh, remember, are you using any currency variables in your regression, right? For instance, in my regression here, you, these were all in US dollars because they were ADR, but let's say they'd be in different currencies. What am I looking at? Price earnings ratios. Price earnings ratios of no currency, it's a ratio. Growth rates, growth rates of no currency, it's a percentage. Return in equity. Okay. If you throw in a, a dollar value or, so let's say you decide to put market cap or revenues in the regression, then you got to be careful, right? Because you have dollar revenues, you've got peso revenues, you can't put them in. One reason why in regressions you want to steer away from dollar value independent variables is precisely for that reason. Right? Mm -hmm. the, one, would... nice thing, one nice thing about S&P Capital IQ though, if you download your data, is you can actually pick the currency in which all of the companies will give you. So if you're using a database that allows you to do it, and if you want to use a dollar value, it allows you to do it because you can download the data in the same currency. So in this particular case, growth is all in US dollars because the in stocks are ADR. Yeah, yeah so, so if they've been yeah. different currencies, then you'd have run into issue even on the growth rate, right? Because one growth rate is in Turkish lira, the other is growth rate in US dollars. You know what you'd have to do? You'd have to bring in the difference in inflation rates to clean up. So the more you deviate from this commonality, the more work you have to do before you're under regression. Doesn't make it impossible to run. It just means you have to do more pre-work. Yeah, so that was just my question. If there are okay. different backgrounds in the companies, there will have to be additional pre In fact, you know, that's part of the reason European equity research has become more European. I mean, 15, 20 years ago, more than that, in the 1990s, a Greek analyst never looked at Turkish companies or at German companies or a German analyst never looked because each country had its own currency. It was these close... As you've got the EU, now everything's in euros. Every growth rate is in euros. It makes it much easier to have these cross-market comparisons than you used to be able to do. Got it. Thank you. Sriram? Um, does a linear regression make sense here? Yeah, how do you decide? In fact, that's a good question. This is a linear regression. How do you decide whether a linear regression makes sense? What is the device we can use to check to see whether linearity works? So what should I be doing before I even run the regression? Uh, it might help to graph it and see what it actually looks like. Exactly. Do a scatter plot of price to book. So in this case, for instance, I would do a scatter plot of price earnings against growth. And what am I looking for? I'm looking to see, it's, it's just eyeballing the data if you want to, to see if the data looks linear enough for you to get away with it. You think, how would I know? A little later in this class, I'm going to show you a non-linear relationship using a scatter plot. And when that happens, you have two choices. One is you can run a non-linear regression. There are actually statistics packages that let you do it, but it's too much, it's just messy. You know, the other thing you can do is, you can transform your independent variable by doing what? By taking the log of it, by taking the... So basically you can try to make it more linear by transforming your independent variable. So I'm gonna hold off on that because I will do that on a couple of follow-up cases where non-linearity was an issue. Here, I actually did the scatter plot. I could live with the linearity. It wasn't perfectly linear, but it was close enough to linear that I could run these regressions. Yeah. So now I've become the European banking analyst. So this is now my sector, right? Most of these names I can't even pronounce, but I'm using price to book ratios. So basically remember you want low price to book. I rank them from lowest to highest. And I've also computed the average and the median across the entire sector. Now this is a pretty big sector, right? So if I said, where would I, what, what am I looking for? Let's assume that the question I have for you is a very simplistic one which is as an analyst or as an investor, what am I looking for here if I'm looking for a cheap bank? And let's go ahead and buy it up. Price to book, what am I looking for? I'm looking for a low price to book ratio. Low relative to what? Let's use the median as a middle point. You want a price to book less than 2.07. What does that do? That already cuts you off at Society General, right? Everything below Society General is overpriced. Okay, that's the first step. In terms of return on equity, 
If you're trying to find a bargain, do you want a low return equity or a high return equity? Do you want a high return equity? So I'm looking for a return in equity that exceeds the median of 11.82%. So let's say Paribas, right? Price to book is lower than the average, that's good. Return equity is higher than the average. In fact, it's the only one of those companies that traded low price to books that has a return equity that, that's higher than the average. So, so far, so good. I found a low price to book stock with a return equity higher than the median. The third variable is standard deviation, which is a measure of risk. There, do I want a low number or a high number if I'm looking for a bargain? I want a low number. In that case, I want a standard deviation that's less than 22%. Remember, I was getting all excited about Paribas. I look at the standard deviation, oh no. There isn't a single stock in this group that, that is a slam dunk. A slam dunk is a stock that trades at below the median in terms of price to book, has a return equity that exceeds the median and a standard deviation or a risk measure lower than the median. That's where I usually start my pricing is I put, are there any companies that just jump out at me because they're so obviously mispriced? Most of the time you won't find an obviously mispriced because nothing ever sticks out that much. So that's one very simplistic way to look at the data is to look at the median in your sample and ask yourself, does my com what, what does my company look like relative to the median? But there's only so far you can go with that. So here's what I did with these banks. I decided to go back to my statistic book, run a regression of price to book ratios against return and equity and standard deviation using that bank sample. Again, Pretty impressive R squared, 79%. You think, what are these numbers in brackets below? Those are my T statistics. I know it's a throwback in time. You've probably forgotten all the statistics you learned. But do you remember what a T statistic has to be to be statistically significant, roughly speaking? Higher numbers are better. Two or above, you know, you feel pretty confident. So basically, what is this regression telling me? Things are, you know, th this is a pretty good regression. R squared is high, the coefficient makes sense. The signs make sense, higher ROE companies of higher price to book ratios, higher risk companies of lower price to book ratios. You say, but you're an analyst, what are you gonna do with the regression? I took every one of my companies in that sample, plugged in their return in equity and standard deviation, came up with the predicted price to book. So if you look at buyer issue, hypo, it's trading at 0.8 times book value based on its return on equity and standard deviation. It's a terrible return equity. Its predicted price to book should be 0.89. If you compare the actual to the predicted, it's undervalued by about 10.6%. And I do this for every company in my group. The most overvalued stock in this, in the, in this particular grouping was Erste, which is I think an East European bank it's 23% overvalued. The most undervalued stock is Royal Bank of Scotland, 16.65% below my predicted value. But rather than compare price to book across companies, I'm taking each company and comparing its price to book to a predicted price to book given how the market is pricing other banks. Raja? Yeah, for price to book, does the median work in industries? I that can't hear you, Raja. I'm sorry. Do you have your mic on? Yes. Can you hear me now? Can you guys hear Raja? I, I can't hear him. Yeah, I think they can hear me, but you. <laughs> oh, wait. Freedom, when you talk, let's see if the problem is on my side or Raja's side. Yeah, I can hear Raja. I can't hear you either. So the problem is obviously on my side. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Okay, let me try that again. Raja, okay, try Raja. again, Raja. Let's see if it works now. Can you hear me now? I'm, I'm, can you hear me now? No, sorry, no, not, not yet. I have no idea what's going on here. I've lost my headphones. Is it still not? Okay, so let, I'll come back to you. Let me see if I can get the headphones going so then we can do the questions. So. Yeah. 
So what I'm effectively doing with every company is getting a predicted price to book ratio based on the data. That's the essence of pricing. You're trusting the market to deliver that expected price. Right? So now let's, let's do a, a, a very different example. So far you've looked at me, I've looked at beverage companies, I've looked at, um, at banks, I've looked at telecom companies. In this analysis, I'm gonna look at the 100 largest market cap stocks in the US. Started 2010, here's what I did. I went and downloaded the highest, uh, the, uh, the stocks with the, which, were the, which had the highest market cap, the 100 largest market cap companies. And then, you know what, let me try something. And we might have to go without, without you, you being able to talk. Can you hear me though? You can hear me, right? Yes. So I took the 100 largest market cap stocks in the US and I did their price to book ratios. I did the price to book ratios for these companies against their return on equity. So basically what you have here is a scatter plot. So there should be a hundred points if you want to count. And you think, what are these lines in there? The middle line is actually a regression line of price to book against return equity in these companies. The two outside lines are the 90% confidence intervals because when you run a regression, there's always a range around your predictions. So most of my hundred companies fall between those two lines, right? Let me ask you a question. If I were, and you know, I, it's obvious if I should ask you questions, unless you can answer. Think about where your undervalued and overvalued stocks fall in this chart, right? Notice there are three stocks below the line and three stocks above the line. The three stocks below the line are my undervalued stocks. The three stocks above the line are my over, over let's take valued out, underpriced stocks. The three stocks above the line are my overpriced stocks before you get too excited and go out and buy the underpriced, the overpriced, let me list what those companies are. The stocks that fell below the line were ExxonMobil, Nokia, and ConocoPhillips. The stocks that fell above the line were Google, Infosys, and Gilead Systems. What, what at least Google and Infosys and Gilead, at least in 2010, you know what they shared? They were all high growth companies. When I looked at price to book to return equity, I'm almost missing my variables. One of the variables I'm missing is growth. High growth companies will tend to look cheap if I ignore growth. Is there a way I can bring in growth into this scatter plot? I mean, I'm looking at price to book return equity. I'm worried about the fact that growth varies across companies. Is there a way I can bring growth in? I don't know whether you've ever done this. It's something I hate doing, but I did anyway. You can draw a three dimensional graph, right? I hate three-dimensional graphs because I have no idea whether I'm coming or going. But in three-dimensional graph, here's what I do. I take price to book, I take return equity, I take expected growth rate. You know where my cheap stocks are in this box because you now have a three-dimensional box, they're in this corner. I want stocks low price to book, high return equity, high growth. I'm looking for stocks in this corner. And guess what? I don't find a single one that's obviously mispriced. Why? Because I'm looking at the 100 largest market cap stocks. Everybody's looking at them. But if I took the 100, 100 mid cap stocks or 100 Turkish stocks, a market that's not as heavily followed, it's entirely possible that I could find a bargain, something that falls in that corner and say, hey, maybe everybody's missing it. That's what you're trying to do in pricing is you're finding mismatches. And looking at it as a picture, perhaps you can find those mismatches. So I'm ignoring growth, I can bring it in. I'm also ignoring risk. So I did another three-dimensional plot where I took price to book return equity and beta. And here are my cheapest stocks are the ones that are in that corner over there. High price, I'm sorry, low price to book, high return in equity, 
but you want a low beta. So I'm looking in that corner. Again, nothing there, but you're trying to look for that mismatch that will lead you to buy the stock. One final do over before I leave this, this example. I took the sample and I ran a regression across the 100 largest market cap companies of price to book against beta, growth rate, and return equity. R squared of 67%. Again, as I said, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. This is about as good as it's going to get when you're looking at financial regressions. But if you look at the output in the regression, I did beta growth and return equity. Growth and return equity come out as pretty impressive. They have statistics that are statistically significant. Higher growth companies have higher price to book ratios, higher return equity companies have higher price to book ratios. But take a look at beta. It's got the right sign, but the T statistic is close to zero. Piece of advice, when you run regressions and you have a regression where you have a variable that has a very low or a close to zero T statistic, take it out of the regression. It's just adding noise to your regression. If I really wanted to use this regression, you know what I'd do? I'd rerun the regression of price to book against return equity and growth rate and take beta entirely out of the process. You think, but beta should be there. There is no should be when you do pricing. If the market says, I don't care, you don't care either. So when you look at these variables, take a look at what matters and what does. In fact, in January, 2020, I updated this graph that I saw. And if I get a chance, I'll show you the, send you the 2021 numbers. At the start of 2020, I got a bunch of overvalued stocks. In fact, a couple of them you won't be surprised by. Tesla and Netflix came out as overpriced on a price to book return on equity basis. The other two I was a little surprised by. Lily, Eli Lilly came out as, un, as overpriced. And the reason that was actually very simple, they'd done a huge buyback over the previous few years that made their book value very low. So they're trading at a high price to book ratio, not because the market shot up, but because the book value dropped. Again, I'm not trying to explain away deviations. I'm looking for a good reason why it might be happening. If I cannot find one, then that's a good reason to take a look. In fact, I valued lows after this to see if in fact it was overvalued. I did find in a DCF that it was overvalued, but I had to do the work to make that judgment. Any questions on, so when you look across companies, even if they're in different sectors, you can still control for differences. So now let me look at a sector that most of us think is incredibly boring and you'd be right, the trucking sector. I'm now the analyst in the trucking sector and I'm gonna put a buy recommend. I know it's very difficult to see these numbers, lots of companies in there. I'm using EV to EBITDA as my base multiple. And the stock I put a buy recommendation on is Rider Systems. It's trading at 2.8 times EBITDA and the, the average Company trades at about 5.6. The median is about five and a half. The basis for my recommendation is Rider Systems looks really cheap on an EV to EBITDA basis. Remember early in the class, I told you what the variables are that drove EV to EBITDA, tax rate, cost of capital, growth rate, reinvestment rate. It's got to be, so if you're asking questions, say, should I buy Rider Systems? The first question you're probably going to ask is, what's the tax rate? I'll set your mind at rest. Right assistance tax rate looks very much like everybody else in the sector. That's not the problem. What's the cost of capital? It's a US company like all of my other companies in the sample. That's not the issue. So what's the reinvestment rate? And here there's a little trick in the trucking business that makes them unique. The trucking business, companies don't reinvest every year. They have a fleet that they replace once every five, six or seven years. You know why they replace the entire fleet? They get bigger discounts when they replace their entire fleet. So if you were asking me about rider systems, I'm wondering what it is that explains a low multiple of EBITDA, one of the questions might, that might be worth asking is how old is your fleet? You know why? If your fleet is really old, you're going to look cheap because any day now you've got to replace the entire fleet, which means you've got to raise capital, buy all those new trucks. In the case of Rider Systems, that was exactly what was happening. They had the oldest fleet in the trucking business and the market was bringing that into the market cap. The reason I bring that up is this was actually something I pulled from an actual buy recommendation that, the, that an analyst had put on Rider Systems based on the DV to EBITDA. It took me all of 15 minutes to collect the data on the, on the, on the age 
of the fleet for every one of these companies. It goes back to what I said earlier. I don't have a problem with people using pricing, but my problem with the way people use pricing is they're incredibly sloppy. They're unwilling to dot their I's and cross their T's. All these analysts had to do was to pull up the annual report for each of these companies, pull the life and put it in a column and it will very quickly see why rider systems look cheap. Last example for today before we end. Okay. You guys familiar with the grocery business? Incredibly boring business. The analysts, I mean, the analysts who track grocery stores must be brain dead by now, right? They're every, every grocery store, it's low growth, terrible margins. But once in a while, you get a newcomer in the business, somebody very different from everybody else. In 2007, that newcomer was a company called Whole Foods. And until 2007, typical grocery store, they all followed the same script, right? 100,000 square feet, you sell everything, you have low margins. Whole Foods changed the script. They said, we're going to sell organic stuff. We're going to sell them at a higher price. We're going to go for higher margins. And in 2007, when Whole Foods first came out, the market priced it way up. So look at how different it looks. There are the rest of the grocery stores. There's Whole Foods. This is like being a five-foot kindergartner, right? You stand out. You're way out there. And of course, if you ask analysts what's going on, their answer was a Whole Foods is higher margins, therefore it trades at a higher multiple of sales, which is technically true. The story is right. So here's what I did. I ran a regression of price to sales against net margins. I could have done EV to sales against operating margins. I've got the same answer. I put in the fact that Whole Foods at a higher margin came up with a predicted price to sales ratio, much higher than the typical grocery store company was actually trading at more than three and a half times that predicted margin was hopelessly overpriced. Two years later, I revisited the sector. You think where the heck did Whole Foods go? It's not above the line, you know where it is? It's actually become the most underpriced stock in the sector. It went from being the most overpriced to the most underpriced. Even I pre when I did the pricing in 2009, based on its margin, I said, it looks cheap to me now. It went from being really expensive to really cheap. 2010, I revisit the sector. It's back to being among the most overpriced stocks. It took the market almost seven years to learn how to price Whole Foods. You know, you know how you learn it's been priced is when it starts to fall towards the middle. Why did it take so long? Because grocery analysts did not know what to do with Whole Foods. It was so different from the typical grocery store company. By the middle of 2015, you know, people knew how to price Whole Foods. But to show you things always stay exciting, in 2015, there's a new kid in town, a company called Sprouts. Again, different from everybody else. You can see it out there. Do you see a pattern here when a company that is different from the sector enters the sector? Analysts, investors don't know what to do with it. Think of Tesla when it first entered the automobile sector. Think of Amazon when it entered retail. So what do they do? They, they're, they're all over the place. They overshoot, they undershoot. And it goes back to what I said at the very start of this class. If the essence of investing is you want to find market mistakes, you're most likely to find them with young companies disrupting businesses where there's a lot of uncertainty, not after they've settled down. Your chances were whole food, with Whole Foods were greatest in terms of making money, 2007, 2008, 2009, not in 2015. You see, I'll try Sprouts now. Sprouts has already settled in. It's already part of you know, analysts have learned to deal with it, but there will be somebody else who comes along who's different in a sector. And don't be surprised to see the pricing overshoot and undershoot because people are applying the multiples they've always used to try to price something that doesn't fit as easily into the rubric. So I'm gonna end with that and I'm sorry about losing the sound. So if you have questions, I'll start the next class with these questions, but um, I will see you on Monday. And if you want to get started on pricing your company sometime before the end of this week, you should get your perfect ECF back but then you can do the pricing and the pricing is a lot less involved. You can actually get done with the project by, you know, whenever you feel like it, because you can get the data and start at least doing the pricing. And it's probably an hour, two hour job and at least to do the basic data analysis.
But if you've never used S&P Capital IQ, go back and review how to get on so you know how to download the data for your company because for pricing, you will need access to a database that allows you to get that data easily. Any final questions before we end for the day? Actually, why am I asking you that? Because you might not be able to even, you can try Sriram, if you want, if you want to unmute and see if, you, if I can hear you, I'm not sure I can, but I can try. Can you hear me? Okay, no. no nothing, okay. I will see you on Monday then, I'm sorry, no. Thank you, professor. <laughs>